Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar, Completions, Maximize Operational Performance and Optimize Spend in the New Reality. Uh, we have a couple of speakers today. Before I introduce them, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, we will be emailing a recording of the session after we're through. Generally, we send this out the day after, so keep an eye out for that in your email inbox. And we will have some time for questions at the end of the presentation. So uh, should you see something here that you want a little bit more information about, feel free to type it into the GoToWebinar questions panel, and we'll get to those at the end. So with that, I'm going to, I'm going to introduce our two speakers today. So our first speaker is Akash Sharma. He's our senior analyst and consultant. And he actually works on our market intelligence team providing petroleum engineering subject matter expertise for various product development and consulting efforts. His expertise lies in unconventional shale reservoirs with a focus on reservoir engineering, reserves estimation, production analysis, rate transient analysis, and data-driven modeling and analytics. And we also have Jonathan Godwin. He is a senior associate, associate of our, on our intelligence team. Jonathan is a, uh, he covers oil field services and supply industries for Inveris. So with over a decade in the oil patch, he has spent time working in or on all the major unconventional plays across the country, mainly focused on completion, implementation, and optimization. So that being said, you guys have the right experts on this call to talk about uh, optimizing completions performance. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jonathan, and he's going to kick us off. Thank you so much, Susie. I um, appreciate the intro there. And Akash, if you will move over to the first slide, I'm just going to kick us yep. off. Um, you know, really, I want to talk through. I want to talk through the the macro picture and kind of set the stage for for a what's happening and b what we think will happen, and really what the implications are for that on the industry over the kind of near to mid term. And so, uh, you know, with our with our modeling and our macro teams, uh, one of the things that that I do and participate in uh, really on a monthly basis is to is to forecast where we think completion activity is going. Uh, along with taking a good hard look at where it's been and where it is at currently. Um, and so based off of our latest forecast and, and all the different pieces that are coming into it, we really see a, a slow and, and steady uh, activity recovery um, over the next year. Really, you know, after this, uh, we've had this very tumultuous middle two quarters, the pace of completions in 4Q, we expect to be, you know, fairly flat. Um, you know, those in the completion industry really over the last two years are, are you know, all too familiar with the with the wild cyclicality that we've had where where one Q hits and everybody budgets reset and everybody wants to spend all their money up front in the beginning of the year. And then come three Q, four Q, we really start tapering off and then things fall off a cliff in four Q. But uh, with the you know kind of unprecedented activity drop that, that we saw you know, in March and April and May. Um, what we've seen is that activity has recovered uh, to where it's really kind of going to recover for the for the rest of the year, and we don't expect to have those same types of drops uh, this fourth quarter that we've had for the past two years. In the fourth quarter, you know, any kind of drop or slowdown will mainly be due to to really winter seasonality. Um, and then as we move into to what next year is going to look like, really, you know, our macro group sees prices kind of range bound at about $50 Brent. Uh, in fact, just today, OPEC Plus, you know, agreed to kind of taper the taper. So they are going to ease the production ads that they had previously planned to start in January. Uh, so instead of they're only going to be adding about 500,000 barrels per day back into back into the picture come January versus I think that's a quarter of what they had planned. So so, you know, it's a little bit of tweaking uh, on the on the overall macro picture from the OPEC plus community that we saw come in today out of Vienna. But, uh, you know, that while that should be positive for price, I think we're going to have to wait and see what the longer term implications are. And then really kind of mm -hmm. closer to home, uh, you know, on, on the macro side of the picture, operators are really talking about this idea of, of Shell 3.0, uh, 
and a you know a, a reasonable limited uh, reinvestment of cash flow into into production and production growth, um, where the focus is going to be free cash flow uh, and free cash flow yield. Uh, also ESG initiatives, right? So so we've seen more of that uh, discussion of both uh, fiscal and environmentally res uh, environmental responsibility really being top of mind for the investment community. And the thing that's important is that, is that those same metrics that are going to be applicable and top of mind for the investor community on the operational side of things are, are also going to be focused on the service sector as well. Um, and so, so when we put that all together, really, you know, so crude faces kind of headwinds next year, but we do see budgets resetting. Uh, and then with the sustained and, and current pace of completions and a healthy duck inventory, we do believe that there is some impetus for completion activity to grow next year, although in a very, you know, constrained manner. Hey, Jonathan, uh, a quick question from uh, my side as we, as we look at this chart. So first of all, uh, you know, to everyone listening, uh, uh, Thanks, Jonathan, for this great overview. Uh, what we want to do as we move forward is like establish this activity uh, baseline as we talk about uh, mm -hmm. fiscal responsibility moving forward, right? So I think this gives this gives a really good perspective. But w one of the things that you know, since I work more on the sides of the operations and like you know the analytics side of things, one of the things that concerns me when I look at this chart is is just the way all of this information is is uh, is estimated, right? So We've been very well aware, and I'm sure everyone who's attending this is also very familiar uh, with how much of a hassle it is to actually figure out how what is out there. Uh, you know what I mean? Right. Like there are, uh, the reporting practices vary so much from state to state, and uh, when we look at an information like that in a high activity period, it's typically easier to get a good estimate because there's so much volume of activity and transactions happening that you can get a better understanding of the business really well, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas if you look at uh, the last six months, you know, the, the the bottom fell out from under the activity graph, as is very clear from the analysis that you put together. So yeah. how how were you able to sort of, you know, uh, let's say, assimilate or account for that lack of activity and the impact it has on the availability of good data to be able to project moving forward? Yeah, uh, and, and that's a great question and great framework for that, Akash. I, I really appreciate that because... Uh, you know, traditionally what we've seen is that our completion data sources are lagged about three months or so before they, they really become reliable. But, um, you know, one of the things that's let us get to a, a very close to, to what I would call a near real-time picture of, of activity has been this product that we've pushed out called Activity Analytics. And if you go to the next slide, um, what I'm actually showing here is is the uh, culmination of of really the output of the activity analytics package, and and what we're doing inside of there is we're using a blend of proprietary data sources to actually get real time detection of where pads have activity and specifically where they have completion activity, and so mm -hmm. so we're able to take things that you know and Veris has always had really like the rig picture right and then. Uh, by taking that and combining it with, you know, satellite and telemetry data and, and some of these other data sources and putting it all together, we're able to really be very specific about where completion activity is taking place on a pad. And, and you're absolutely right. Like what that has done then is it has pulled our view forward, because if we were uh let's say that we were in may right if we were in mm -hmm. may and and we know from from listening to data sources and and people out there like what's happening but we can't actually see that in the data yet because it wasn't coming through will a tool like this actually let us see the bottom in completion activity take place and you'll notice that uh, what you see is that in about May, the middle of May, we saw we saw active fracture pads or or the estimated number of frac crews out there get down to about 50 crews running. Um, and wow. so we kind of bounced around, uh, you know, below that. But, you know, you see like February, right, that we were up around 250. And so uh, a massive drop, very, very steep. 
Uh, the mm -hmm. other part of that too, so, so what's interesting is, and what you see on this curve is on the white line there, that whitish gray line, that's actually our, our horizontal rig count. And then the, the stack is the, is the number of active fracture pads that are happening on a daily basis. And then that dashed line is actually the ratio in between the two. And so what you get here is, is we're able to, in, in very real time, compare the number of frat crews that are out there to the number of horizontal drilling rigs that are out there and look at that ratio. And what that ratio tells us is it really tells us how inventory is changing, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and so inventory becomes so, an important part of that picture. Go ahead. Yeah. So my question, I guess, when I look at this is there's this peak of that rig to fleet, right, between April to, let's say, July. So mm -hmm. would that be indicative uh, uh, of an, like, that looks to me like a, a big duck building period. And it's interesting to me that the industry was out, you know, drilling and building ducks in June, July. That is sort of the middle of the worst of the pandemic. So wh why do you think we saw that sort of you know, uh, why do we see that sort of shape in that data set? Sure, yeah, so so the, the shape of that really is precipitated by, uh, in my view, two things. Number one of which is, is that the rig contracts are generally a little more punitive uh, in, in how fast they can be dropped and what happens when they're dropped versus the, versus the frac uh, contracts. And so, you know, I mentioned the fact that, that the, that the frac crews dropped, uh, well, uh, the frac crews have dropped faster than, than the drilling rigs. And I also yep. mentioned in that last slide really about the nature of the cyclicality that we've seen in, in the completion activity. And so, so that completion activity cyclicality was made possible by the fact, I think in large part to the fact that the, the completion contracts didn't have a lot of the pricing power that the rig contracts did because we were in such an oversupplied state uh, for, the, for the pressure pumping market. And so they just didn't have oh, the okay. teeth that, that the rig contracts do. And, and so when we hit that kind of twin black swan event of both the pandemic and then you know, uh, OPEC deciding to get into a pricing war uh, in, mm -hmm. in you know, late February, early March, what happened is that the completion crews dropped and they, they dropped much faster because there weren't the, the contractual obligations uh, that there were like with the rig contracts there. And so you heard of a lot of a lot of companies going on a quote unquote frack holiday. Right. And it, yeah. particularly in the Bakken and the Permian and, and some of those plays where where they said, you know what, we're going to maintain a rig. Uh, but we're not going to do any completions. And so that happened, you know, not necessarily universally, but that happened in kind of the same mindset across a lot of the plays, uh, minus the gas plays. The gas plays showed a lot more stability through this uh, because they didn't, you know, the, the gas prices weren't nearly as affected as, as the oil prices. So they've kind of been depressed and really, in our view, on their way back up for, for a little yeah, while. And now. you can see that in like the Appalachia curve is not, getting as skinny as some of the other oil rich plays for example yeah absolutely like like appalachia kind of took over the market share of of where frack activity was taking place uh yeah. as the other plays dropped you know very precipitously now since then june and july completion activity bounced back and and the large majority of that bounce back was in the permian basin both the delaware and yeah. and the midland basins right have, have seen that frack activity bounce back most of the other plays have remained fairly uh, repressed and uh, but you know so the gas act plays have lost market share uh, a, a little bit yeah so based on what you told me the way I understand me and correct me if I'm wrong here but uh, completion uh, there was the rig punitive aspect but it also seems to be that uh, completion activity took a major hit because it was much more closer to production and this mm -hmm. loss of you know demand and the OPEC uh, production war earlier in the year led to a significant impact on demand for that commodity. So we basically sort of stopped the closest stack to the end cycle, right? Having ducks doesn't impact the amount of production, so you can build those out. So if I'm correct there, first of all, how, how does this relate to uh, sort of the forecast as you move forward, right? Because it almost seems to me that specific regions are growing differently and there's so many more dials that are being you know, tweaked. So how does this sort of correlate to as you look forward 
uh, on this sort of regional activity. Yeah, sure. So, so A, you're absolutely right that uh, really like the impact of this is of the completion drops is, is the fact that they are closer to the production side of things. And when you can leave that money in the ground and not have that flush production in a shell well take place, where you get all of this kind of easy excess production at the beginning life of the well, if you aren't producing that into a low price environment, you come out better you know, on your on your MPV in the long run. And so so it makes sense for most operators to to leave that production, that potential production in the ground and wait for a better price environment if they can, uh, you know, depending on how they have to sustain cash flow and things like that. But if you go to the next slide, uh, the way that that all of this translates then into into the the forecast is really to understand in real time what's happening with our inventory. And, and we delineate inventory in two major pieces. The first one is the natural inventory, which is think of that as like the minimum work in place uh, inventory. And so if you have X amount of rigs running, you know, you can't, you aren't going to move a rig onto, or you aren't gonna move a completion crew onto a well as soon as that rig is done drilling it, if it's on a three or four well pad. You know, you're gonna you're gonna build up several wells on a pad. You're gonna move that rig, and then the completion crew is gonna come in later. And so you have some delay discrepancy that's that's natural to the whole process of of rigs and completion crews. And so there's always gonna be three to four months of of minimum work in process inventory in between the the rigs that are out there and and the completion crews that are running. Uh, and so that's the natural inventory of that gray piece, right? So it's just natural inventory buildup due to due to that. But then those colored bars are really the excess, what we call the true excess duck inventory. And that's really your your wells that you have in that inventory that you're able to pull from and 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 really begin to draw down that are that are in excess of the number of rigs that are running. And this is where uh, this idea of 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 um, really your ability to use ducks as a capital efficiency lever is coming from this, this group of wells in that color band. And so, uh, you know, when we looked at that last chart, we saw that the discrepancy in between the rate of completions activity drop and really the timing of the completions activity drop uh, preceding the, the drop in rigs uh, led to, if you look at that red line and it going up to 1,200, like that is, we were building, we were building ducks uh, through that time period at one of the fastest builds that we've ever seen. <clears throat> and then as we so move into, it, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, so the, this is basically, if I'm correct, this also corresponds to the peak in the rigs to fleet ratio that we saw in the previous chart. Yes. Right. I, I would assume yes. it's in the same time period. Yeah, exactly. Like those two things, those two things should align uh, very, very closely to to I where think. we see that ratio changing and peaking, uh, uh, and and where we see this this rate of of builds and burns happening. And so that yeah, those two peaks should overlap there. Um, and and so uh, I guess what the point that that I'm trying to get here is is that is that we did build up. Um, our, we did build up our excess duck inventory very, very quickly. However, we have transitioned into a duck burning regime. You know, we're now burning about 200 wells or so per month. Uh, starting in July, we started to burn uh, wells out of the duck inventory. And, and even though we built up this, this very, very large excess duck inventory and our, our natural inventory is, is low due to the number of rigs that are running, right? It, it's not going to last forever. And, and so while the duck inventory can sustain capital efficiency for a time, it's not the long-term solution, right? And, and that, <clears throat> And what I'm trying to get at here is, is that we do have this, it is a lever, it will help in 2021, but it's not necessarily the long-term answer. And, and as we move into um, <clears throat> this new regime and what's gonna happen next year, and, and if you'll go to the next slide real quick, Akash, um, I, I really wanted to come back to this because this is really kind of the linchpin argument for uh for the lower 48 next year is that we've got this story of constrained activity growth from current levels right like the ducks do help 
they will help improve capital efficiency, but operators are going to continue to be pressured to, to show uh, good capital efficiency, and there's going to be increased scrutiny on that. And investors aren't stupid. They do know that the duck inventory will last for a while, but it's going to run out at some point in time. And so when that runs out, what are the different levers that they can pull for, for how they approach uh, cost optimization, and then what tools exist for them to approach that data in really a rigorous, analytical, but consumable format. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that that's a great point, Jonathan. Uh, you know, when we look at, especially with the sort of volatility that we've seen in the market, uh, as you pointed over the last couple of years, and the, the complications that come with it, uh, you know, not just from a standpoint of uh, on the on the BD or the market development side for a lot of these operators, but also from a standpoint of you know c consuming raw materials that go into making these trends happen, right? Uh, the purchasing aspect of it, the spend aspect of this, has also become exceedingly important for the customer base that I have had the fortune to work with, and also increasingly so become part of the day-to-day -day vernacular across the industry. Uh, and that, that goes back to exactly what you're saying, is that fiscal responsibility and operating within your means is, is extremely important. But at the same time, you know, shale particularly is a fast declining asset from a production rate standpoint. So if I have to maintain steady production, I also have to maintain a healthy process of, mm -hmm. you know, a healthy process of continued development and, uh, you know, activity. So it's like a, you need to be a very efficient, but also really powerful engine somehow at the same time. Yes. And so to work with that, what I wanted to sort of introduce to to everyone here is is the idea on how we as Inveris approach the cost perspective here. Uh, you know, uh, this, this all started uh, through the process of an acquisition we made a couple of years ago that allowed us to really understand information on, on a transactional basis going across in the industry. And what we were able to leverage is um, that information, combining that with sort of our analytics capabilities in-house to develop uh, a suite of products, but key amongst them uh, for this discussion has been sort of a market indices, right? Uh, market indexes, uh, indices have been uh, uh, commonplace. You know, I know there are a bunch of, uh, I think the Federal Reserve provides a few of them for all these different industry uh, sub-industries. And you can start, start to see what the market is doing, how it's performing. But there was a lot of concerns around how that data is sourced. It's survey based. It's a lot of, it's a complicated formula and how we do it. So we wanted to try and see if we can approach it from a different perspective and lend uh, a different uh, perspective on, uh, to enable a lot of these teams uh, that have to make decisions really quickly, right? We went from having, uh, if I remember the numbers on your chart correctly, Jonathan, uh, from about 200, 250 frac uh, crew pads in like February, March to about 50 in May, right? That, that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's like, almost 70% of the market gone uh, in like in like quarter and so the the supply chain needs the planning needs the perspective on how i manage the remaining activity and the remaining budget have to change completely right and yes. it varies so much basin by basin that it can have a huge impact on how you you know approach this and so to start off with that point because you know as you mentioned there's a big change in the way permian and for example appalachia have progress even through this uh, pandemic and uh, you know the OPEC cycle and everything and mm -hmm. so if we start off with the the first view here uh, what we're trying to look at is is indexes uh, that we put together and we've created very very specific indexes we put together indexes for individual mesh sizes for particular basins or specific individual chemicals because a lot of these things are you know dependent on so many different variables Right, uh, 100 mesh it has a very di different development and need, like uh, demand supply life cycle uh, as compared to 40 by 70 northern white. Right, uh, mm -hmm. if we look at, for example, chemicals, crosslinkers is based out of Guar, which is a uh, which is sourced from uh, you know farmlands in India, which is very different from how you would manufacture polyacrylamide for friction reducers. So yes. looking at the granular perspective really makes a difference. But if you if you look at this and I, you know Jonathan, I'm going to ask you to uh, pro provide some more commentary here, but uh, being the proper expert. But if you look at these two things, what's really interesting to me is 
uh, first of all, the dotted line in both cases is the actual index, but we also provide sort of a zone of uh, uncertainty. And it's not necessarily a confidence interval or uncertainty. It provides a range where a majority of that transactional information would reside in, right? So what, uh, for example, what the US chart tells me is that nationally speaking, once we weighted based on activity and pricing variations, the the 100 mesh market seems to have consolidated significantly and is skewed very heavily towards the lower end of the pricing range, right? There are still transactions happening on the upper side of it. Again, that's a regional supply demand issue there. But you know, it tells me that nationally, when you look at the overall numbers, it is very tightly hugging the bottom side of the market. But yeah. the, the story on the Permian specific is really different, right? And I, like when you look at that chart, when you look at Permian again, we're still looking for uh, still looking for a flow there. But you know, being being a very sort of stable but skinnier distribution of data. What, what how does this correlate to? Sort of your analysis on the activity and completion design in the basin. Yeah, so uh, thanks for that, Akash. I think that um, so there's a couple things that are happening here, and and it is really really interesting when you put it in context of. And I think the key thing is uh, what you said was that this is activity weighted, right? So so the U.S. Yep. index kind of seeking towards the bottom really puts it into perspective of the fact that the Permian has played such a huge role over the last, you know, really two years. Uh, and then really the introduction of local um, in-basin sand contributing even more so, specifically in the Permian where, where that in-basin sand has blown up, that market has grown, you know, a thousand percent over the last three years uh, and, and it's been really, really interesting to watch what happens to profit prices and then also the fact that you are pulling that whole index down because of the fact that, that profit prices are so cheap in the Permian. Now, it really is interesting, like you said, like there is, there's a large variance of price mainly due to, to regional aspects in places like Appalachia where you don't have the same access to in-basin sand and you're still railing a lot of that that northern white sand which does carry a higher cost premium a large part of that due to the transportation there um, and then on the Permian side of things where we see just this flood of in-basin sand come in we've seen this just steady downward trend ever since 2018 of that 100 mesh mm -hmm. price index and and really that goes to two things is is a you know, that, that influx of in-basin sand, but also the preponderance and the tendency to use 100 mesh sand. Um, and I think too, really some of the widening up of the, of the uh, uh, mesh distribution of what is 100 mesh, you know, uh, most of the time people call it 4170, but we've seen really those kind of cuts due oh, to yeah. mine efficiency um, <clears throat> be a little bit looser. Uh, and people being willing to pump, uh, I guess, a little bit broader spectrum sand uh, as 100 mesh too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, a couple of different things at play there. Um, I think it is really interesting too to note that, like, say, like the U.S. index getting bumped uh, at May of 2019, right? Or, or in that in mm -hmm. that time frame. You know, I talked about the cyclicality that's happened in the completion activity market. And, and what this shows us is that we've seen that same cyclicality get introduced into the profit markets where everybody tries to front in low capital, spend all their dollars up front in the year. And, and lo and behold, we have a, a crunch on sand as more people are trying to pump more profit at the same time. Uh, and so yeah. that, that brings in, you know, tighter, tighter prices. Uh, and then, of course, you know, plants ramp up and, and we see those those price that impetus for for slightly higher prices fade away as well. No, absolutely. I think one of the things that you mentioned uh, was really interesting. And thanks for giving me a great segue into the next slide. But uh, one of the reasons that 100 mesh became so popular is because we sort of start transitioning away from cross-linked and linear gel-heavy fracks to, you know, more and more slick water, right? And so we saw friction reducer become such a big component of completion design. And so as we looked at uh, another example as we walked through this, uh, what in this analysis that we did was uh, we combined actually the price index that we put together, again, for very specific friction reducers in the Permian Basin 
uh, we combine that with the analysis that you all had put out, uh, Jonathan, about the activities, right? So we can mm-hmm. sort of correlate completion activity in a particular region, since the index is already driven partly by that, combine that with the uh, sort of changes or uh, sort of trends in prices that we saw when the uh, you know the existing behavior in uh, let me rephrase that. So what we're able to do is correlate the changes in prices that come out as a result of suddenly changing activity or slowly changing activity, right? So once we establish that correlation, that if we had X number of fleets in such an amount of time, what is the potential impact on pricing of a material, right? It also goes to the point that you just mentioned that uh, what we saw in the profit in the May bump, right? Uh, people are trying to front load uh, a lot of the spending, make sure that their planning is right, a lot of RFQs are due early in the year. Uh, we also see that uh, we also see uh, saw that like in 2018 when the slick water craze originally began, and that's why we see that price, you know, in the initial bumps is because people were trying to get into longer term contracts. Uh, I've been in multiple consulting engagements, so one of the things that uh, clients wanted us to figure out was, uh, do you think we are going to run out of uh, polyacrylamide or friction reducer, right? Uh, and uh, that, if you think about the rate at which we went from pumping polyacrylamide in 20, let's say 16, 17 to 18. Like that's, mm-hmm. that's not an invalid concern, right? Uh, no. And so I, I think that starts to make a big impact and that allows us to sort of look forward in the next eight to 12 months and try to correlate how particular chemical prices would vary based on this, right? And mm-hmm. so before, before, uh, before I engage you on this, I think one thing that I also wanted to highlight was just how different again i might be repeating myself here but like how different regional uh regional markets are which i think makes all of this so much more interesting right so the three yeah. lines that i'm showing there jonathan the orange blue and red uh, are uh, activity volume and transactional dollar weighted indexes that we put together for the entirety of the united states right and so while the general market is similar and we saw a bigger bump, let's say in 2018, in early 2018, as you see in the prices as compared to national numbers, because similar to Propin, you know, Permian was driving so much of that activity that that whole FR 100 mesh craze came out of this basin, right? But what we also see is that it's such a tighter spread, you know, mm-hmm. nationally speaking, right? Mm-hmm. Which uh, I think it speaks to the variance uh, of uh, and the, just the, how different the market is. So when when you look at something like this and compare sort of the U.S. distribution versus the Permian distribution on a key commodity like this, you know, what are your thoughts on uh, as you look at this analysis? Well, uh, you know, a couple things. I think that that if we were to um, <clears throat> It, it seems like at first glance, it may be a little bit counterintuitive uh, that that the Permian region, which would command maybe the most pricing power, seems to, to have a higher discrepancy in price of FR paid. But I think when you link that back to activity and where the, the majority of activity is taking place, like it, it makes a lot more sense, right? Um, yeah. And so when you begin to put that in perspective of the fact that the FR market in the Permian is is much larger than than in other basins uh, and and what they what they need and and what they were demanding at that time, uh, you know, really is is pretty interesting. I think you've had some interesting commentary there. Yeah, no, absolutely, and it's it's also like you know, to your point, it's relative scaling, right? So the national market is definitely bigger than the Permian market, right? But the mm-hmm. Permian market for the size and activity it commands is much larger than any other basin's relative market size. And yeah. uh, we've had so many conversations with the operators where a lot of their, and we've seen, if you look at the gray zone carefully, it's getting skinnier as we move from left to right, right? So there is some, there is focus, there is some consolidation there. But uh, the suppliers know that they can command a better price. Uh, the operators know that this is the key component which I think we've gone from what about 12% or so in 2016 to almost 30 to 35% of a frac job uh, is friction reduced, right? So I think what yeah. that allows to do, there's just more power uh, on the sell side. And I think additionally, uh, the ramp up speed a lot was so much focused on you know drilling and completing the next well. The pace was so fast mm-hmm. that many times you know putting your head down and focusing on sort of what does this mean from a cost perspective sort of got can get lost 
And so with that, what I wanted to show you is a quick example on how you know, we sort of approach this problem. And so one example that we're doing here is uh, sort of starting to do some benchmarking, right? So benchmarking a particular operator's index relative to the market, give them some perspective. Uh, the index, that is our national uh, profit index. The operator index is, is made up. Uh, it's just, you know, I'm not disclosing, there's no, uh, there's no actual operator's data here. Uh, it's just a random curve, we uh, randomize those curves. But, it, it, you know, I would not be surprised if there are multiple operators with a similar curve out there, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of operators took uh, initiatives to find cost savings opportunities as we got past that initial bump as you spoke about, right, 2018 and then 2019. Both of those are reflected in the operator's curve as well, but they're sort of slightly offset uh, because, of course, you know, individual trends are different. But I think what, what was really interesting to me when I look at this is, you know, what does it mean from a cost saving perspective, right? There is so much that you can end up leaving on the table because uh, of how and when certain initiatives are kicked off. So for this perspective, uh, you know, I looked at the distribution where they were, you know, technically over the market or beating the market, but basically there was a discrepancy between the way the market was trending and where this operator was trending. And you combine that with, I, and these are, I took completion, uh, completion activity trends for three operators of varied sizes, and they have like differences in the way their schedule works, right? Some of them picked up activity in 2019, some of them picked up more activity in 2018, and others have been relatively flat. And so what we find is that, uh, you know, in all three cases, even after the operator spent, if I go back on the last slide, the last almost, what, uh, I'd say roughly about 10, 11 months under beating the market, they mm -hmm. still end up cumulatively overspending because they haven't recovered that delta, right? Because yeah. there was so much activity in early 2018 that that overpayment is sort of, you know, it keeps on sort of staying there, uh, it sort of stays there when you look at the cumulative perspective. And now while I know that, you know, every year budgets are different, nobody's looking at 2018 spending to, you know, account for 2019 spending. I think what this tells us more importantly is why being proactive is important, right? Yes, Making these absolutely. decisions sooner rather than later is critically mm -hmm. important because of the amount of cost savings that are, that are potentially here. Well, yeah, I mean, to put that in perspective, right, like like this would be for a small operator, like, you know, 27 million would be, call it, you know, nearly five wells worth of, yeah. uh, you know, worth of completions or total total well cost. Right. So so you are you are, are hampering your ability when we put this in perspective of really the capital efficiency. And the cost optimization, like you, you really, it comes down to a like timing is everything. I think this like very clearly points out that timing is everything. Like when you spend that money, and and how far or under you are of the benchmark, you know, and and puts you in a competitive position next to your peers. Uh, so timing is everything. How you spend it, when you spend it, and then really like it allows you to go back and for the future when we talk about how important the the impetus for for cost efficiency is going to be and how much focus is going to be there. Like this is going to become super super critical. Um, I think it, it just it, it begins to draw everything in perspective. And are you beating the market is, I think, going to be a, a standard question that you have to ask on almost every aspect, uh, you know, like what region you're in, what chemical or what what material you're dealing with, like all of those things, like putting it in comparison, it brings it home to how do you approach this idea of fiscal responsibility? No, absolutely. And I think like one of the one of the biggest challenges that like I have heard as we interact and work with these customers on this is uh, there are a lot of moving parts in these processes, right? Like mm. I am not sourcing one, you know, one individual chemical at a time, right? Uh, now, don't get me wrong. Uh, I know for a fact that there are operators who do get into that level of great granularity and minutiae, and I'm yeah. sure the, the people on the call who are familiar with them as well. But you know, others are just wanting to get like an upside perspective, like an, uh, just an overview perspective. And so, and also sort of combine a lot of these variables. So for that, what we also work on and like provide is looking at the entirety of the market. So as an example, uh, the, let's look at the left side first. Uh, we look at, we sh showed you the Permian index, right? But 
the, the friction radius index is not the entirety of the Permian Basin's cost, right? It, it is a big mm -hmm. chunk. It's an increasingly bigger chunk. But there are other, also other variables that make a big impact, right? And, and it's important for us to understand these things and how they correlate to overall frac price because that can also help us understand what the expected forecast is, right? So as an example, uh, and I'm not saying there's that anything like this that I'm aware of that's out there, but let's say a biocide, you know, that is particular that is being used right now. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Jonathan, that there are more and more ESG responsibilities that are coming out. Just let's assume that a regulatory uh, policy comes out that causes an additional tariff on a particular chemical used in a biocide, right? So that biocide's price increases by, let's say, 10%. Now, it's very important for me if I'm planning and budgeting for X number of completions next year to figure out what that would mean, A, from sourcing biocide, who can I still source that biocide from and all that things, but also what does that mean for my frac cost, right? If my biocide went up 10%, what does that mean for my frac cost in different regions? Because the regulations would can again be different, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think combining that information is really important. And on the other side, I want to uh, sort of uh, call back to uh, a point that you made a few slides ago about the difference between Appalachia and Permian cost, right? And especially yeah. in the propent side. And so the the way propent is shipped and, and like transported across the Permian is so different from the Appalachia that if I want to understand the overall market, you know, just looking at the commodity price is just one side of the story, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you have to understand sort of the logistics aspect of it. And because even though like, you know, a few years ago, it was a very small portion of the overall cost, as propent has gotten cheaper and cheaper, the logistics part has become more and more critical in creating the most optimized solution that you can. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, when you're talking, you know, profit prices down where they're at, like the the profit hauling and logistics portion of that can can make up uh, up to 20% of the cost or more. And and so it becomes oh, wow. increasingly important, right, to, to figure out like, A, like where you're sourcing your profit from regionally, and can they get it to you inside of a certain radius, you know, on trucking and, and uh, you know, for the purposes of, of this talk and, and really in these indices, right, it, it helps you to gauge where you are at inside of inside of the overall market, right? So you might be, you might be getting your profit price at a little bit lower cost, but if you are paying more for hauling and it's 20% of the total cost, you know, like how much is that impacting the whole thing? And so it really takes something like this where you're able to put the different components of the cost together in order to really get a full and proper gauge of, of where your spend is in relation to, to others in, in that market. No, absolutely. And I think for me, one thing that really ties all of these things together is just how, uh, you know, the trends that we saw in yours part of the uh, presentation about changing activity and changing performance correlate to how different pricing strategies have been adopted, right? And it really allows us to, as we look forward to, uh, you know, shale 3.0, more fiscally responsible uh, operations, you know, how different components, uh, you know, proactive supply chain initiatives, more integration work with operations, engineering, SEM, procurement teams, and then combining the information that we know both about fundamentals, uh, market activity, as well as, you know, maybe a little bit more uh, specific uh, price uh, behaviors of individual commodities can provide sort of a holistic strategy for operators moving forward. And yeah. so with that, uh, we'll open the floor for uh, questions. If you guys have any questions, uh, please add it to the Q&A section. Uh, and we'd be happy yeah, to answer them. Job, if not, then... um, Sorry, go ahead, Susie. We, well, yeah, we do have a, a question here. So um, could you maybe provide uh, some situations that you guys have been in where you've used this, these market indices with um, with different operators kind of, you know, in your discussions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So, uh, uh, I mean, given that it is, you know, transactional information and proprietary data, I won't be able to release any names or anything of that sort. But I think there are a couple of examples where uh, I think that it was interesting what we were able to do working on uh, specific uh, sort of case studies with, with operators. So uh, uh, I think one example that sort of comes to mind, you know, first and foremost is 
uh, we were working with a uh, operator a multi basin operator and uh, you know they had uh, they had uh, they had several contracts on on uh, on uh, their complex services piece and they knew that they were uh, they were they believed that they were sort of overpaying x percentage uh, because of the quality of service and the quality of uh, you know just the relationship there and the faith they had in the supplier which is all well and good right i, I think that that's a, that's a good way to build your business as long as it's within the budget and if you can trust the supplier i think that's a healthy relationship but there but i think the problem that came out was that they were not aware of the fluctuations that were happening in the overall market right so when when they became aware of that it allowed them to get a better perspective on as they negotiate moving forward on uh, to be more sort of dynamic in their contract structures and pricing and i think that that that's really important because you know as we saw some of these uh, some of these categories uh, their pricing falls off like 60% over you know multiple years so even if you have a long standing relationship with the supplier having a better understanding of the market and having a more you know data driven conversation around it can really help maximize your cost savings in the area very good basically putting you in a stronger negotiation position with your suppliers absolutely yeah and i think one of yeah. the things that we one of the things that we hear all the time also is that you know uh, there is there is mandates that come even on the operator side that hey we need a 30% discount across the board uh you know it comes from there there are specific irr numbers that companies are trying to hit it's completely viable uh, but the problem is that not every supplier can give you that percentage of a discount right uh, as we saw in jonathan's part of the discussion uh completion companies are going to recover faster than rigs right so their cash flow is going to become fa- be generated sooner than some other company so depending on the com- company that you're working with uh it's very important to be aware on how their market is doing so that you know do they have the financial fiscal strength to offer discounts because mm-hmm. you might be just negotiating and running up on a wall your time might be better suited going going and working with a supplier whose industry is doing better and they can potentially afford to give you that uh, that uh, that sort of discount and i think that's something jonathan that you guys also built out in your uh, analysis uh, i think a couple of months ago right looking at different segments yeah like it was it was really um <clears throat> it's really interesting and informative when you begin to put uh put all these different pieces in context of the total health of the market and and certain vendors and supplier groups out there are are definitely more healthy than others and and so you know it's all well and good to tell your investor community that oh well we're you know we we need a 30% price cut uh but attaining that, obtaining that from, uh, say, like a pressure pumper who's already operating on razor thin margins is is probably not going to be viable. Uh, and so you have to consider what the long term impacts are to to both the the market itself and and your uh, and your vendors, right? Um, and and also for the vendors themselves, understanding that that say like the bands on your on your price index that the cost variance is is very low uh, for a particular group mm-hmm. really uh, helps make the argument that there's not a lot of room to give inside inside of that band right like where else can we find cost cuts uh, <clears throat> and have the confidence to know that you can challenge uh, an operator on on that side of things so I think these work both ways and are very important for both groups of people no absolutely it's always oh. better to know than to not know Mm-hmm. So, for can you speak to um, maybe how these market indices might help an operator in having conversations with their investors? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I think that that's one of the things that you know we work a lot of times with, uh, especially on our audit side, uh, uh, with the uh, with the uh, uh, board presentations and those sort of uh, you know more corporate sort of analysis. Uh, I think. Yeah, every every operator definitely wants to be in the top quartile of their cost savings operation, right? Uh, I think this is this is a conversation I've had with many operators, especially over the last few months, as we get into you know planning 2021 phase. Everyone wants to be in the top quartile. Well, if everyone is in the top quartile, then that's not the top quartile anymore, right? So I think there there has to be realization that there is always going to be a distribution, 
and, and it's important for different operators as they set their priorities to have varying expectations across their portfolio. You know, we've worked with operators who uh, identify that the next, let's say, X number of months are going to be more LOE focused. So for the time being, depending on how their assets have performed over the last six months, they want to focus on these one or two categories. And what this allows them to do is, you know, as Jonathan mentioned, go back to their shareholders, go back to their board and show with evidence that they are being fiscally responsible. They are part of the Shell 3.0 community of companies. And, you know, being uh, sort of the market leader in working within your cash flow and being very, very smart about it by making sure that they're trying to maximize their efforts and cost savings in areas that matter the most. Right. If I'm going to be just producing legacy gas wells for the next six months, let's make sure my compression is on point. Right. That that's the big ticket item. Right. And so I think that that's that's the sort of thing. It's it's investor con confidence, it's shareholder confidence, and just having a data driven proof to show how you're performing. Yeah, uh, Akash, I would just add too that that I think the that one of the really interesting things, and to further that point is. Like let's say let's say that you are overspending on a category. For example, let's throw surfactant into the mix, right? Uh, and let's say that you mm -hmm. are you believe that it works, and and what it does is it tells you, okay, I'm over the mark here. They're going to ask a question about that, and I better have a justification for why I'm putting money into this category. That it relates back to the whole idea of capital efficiency, and whether that is MPV or what have you. Whatever the metric is that you're going to be judged by is does that hold up under the scrutiny of, of the question, why am I spending more here than, than the market average? Absolutely. And like, you know, that's especially true as we go like on completions. Then, you know, how many generations of completions have been like in the last three years, right? And so as you keep on iterating on these completion designs, you're mm -hmm. going to end up spending more on one thing or the other. But mm -hmm. the ability to tie it all back together again to your NPV, to your net productivity and things like that uh, is really important, especially when you go and talk to your uh, you know, board or to your shareholders. Yep. Awesome, guys. Well, we are almost to uh, the top of the hour, so or the bottom of the hour, I guess. Um, so just. Uh, in closing, I wanted to let you guys know, if you guys have any questions or want to learn a little bit more detail about uh, the market indices that they were showing here, um, we'd be happy to show you um, and, and talk you through how that works. Um, if you'd like to set up some time, you can always email us at businessdevelopment at com. And with that, as I said, we will be sending this recording out to all attendees so thank you so much for joining us today and stay safe and stay healthy until we talk to you again. Thanks for joining. Bye. Thanks, Huey. Thanks, Thanks Jonathan. Thank you, everyone.